Welcome to the finalization of our Zero Energy Design course. I hope you have learned a lot and enjoyed yourselves on the way towards this final week of the MOOC. Tess and I have studied the final submissions of plans and in this last lecture I will discuss three of them from slightly different climates. The first case is from R. Horvath, who lives in Budapest, Hungary, which has a continental climate. Here you see the starting conditions for the apartment block R. Horvath chose which uses 2,745 cubic meters of gas for heating, hot water and cooking. In addition, the house uses more than 6,000 kilowatt hours of electricity for lighting and all sorts of appliances. Taking into account the efficiency of power plants, the primary energy use is approximately 14,000 kilowatt hours. So, the total demand is more than 32,000 kilowatt hours or 40,000 kilowatt hours in primary energy. Our Horvat uses a slightly different conversion factor for gas, but that's okay. To me, this seems a very high demand for energy. Hungary's continental climate is characterized by cold winters and warm summers. Only 40% of all hours can be made comfortable by means of passive design measures alone. So, technical help is needed. Our Horvat proposes several measures to reduce the energy demand and to reuse waste heat from ventilated air. Here above you see the reduction. The remainder has to be met with PV panels. Next to solar panels, our Horvath proposes to add food production to the roof of their apartment building. In total, the reduce and reuse steps lead to a very low remaining energy demand per flat, but I doubt if the percentages and reductions shown here can be just be summed up. In real life, the remaining electricity demand will be higher than 64 kilowatt hours per apartment, I'm afraid. Our Horvat calculates that with this, current cal uh, with this current calculation, the PV panels could create an overproduction. It might well be, but I think it, would be, it wouldn't be this much. This is a nice scheme that demonstrates all measures taken. It would be very worthwhile to realize this new zero energy food producing building. Next example comes from Martin Brase from Estonia, which has a cold climate. One could call it a continental climate, but it's rather a cold temperate climate, as we will see later. Here you see Martin's starting conditions and his detached house in Turva. For heating, the house uses firewood, not gas, as most other houses. It is equivalent to 13,000 kilowatt hours. The electricity is used for all other applications and appliances. 3,600 kilowatt hours in end use. That brings the total demand to 70,000 kilowatt hours or 21,000 when converted to primary energy. This is a relatively moderate demand, I think. The climate in Estonia is rather cold, 7 degrees on average, with extremes that are actually not really extreme compared to the average. Therefore, I think calling it a cold temperate climate seems more appropriate. In his analysis, Martin came to some advantages and disadvantages of the current house. Here you see the measures proposed by Martin. They seem logical and apt to me. Insulation, air tightness, window replacement, a conservatory and more effective wood stove. He calculated that herewith the amount of firewood would be reduced by 90%. That would save a lot of trees. This is a nice image of these energy demand reducing measures, which also include the planting of trees that protect the house against harsh winter winds and provide some shading in summertime. Regarding e reuse, ventilation is the main issue, and as Martin correctly states, when making the house airtight, mechanical ventilation becomes important, including heat recovery, as well as winning heat from the wood stove exhaust. He estimates that 90% of the current ventilation losses could be avoided. That seems fair to me. Here is a scheme Martin drew of the new heat recovery system. You can see the exhaust to the northeast and the fresh inland to the southwest. Finally, Martin of course proposes PV panels to produce the remaining demand of energy by the house, for which he adds 20 panels to the roof. In his calculation, these panels produce 6,760 kilowatt hours, but according to my own figures, that would be too optimistic. Nonetheless, 
it would be sufficient for the house, which indeed would still have to be connected to the electricity get grid to solve differences between the seasons. Unless the house, of course, would have a big battery. This is a nice overview of what the house would look like after Martin's interventions. And this is the final calculations, showing an overproduction, which I would estimate lower, but still enough to make the house energy neutral. Martin also brought up two good discussion points, indicating that we should not solely focus on saving operational energy when this requires a big environmental footprint. I fully agree. We need to decide what measures are legitimate to make a building net zero energy. These measures themselves also require energy, especially when you talk about high-tech solutions. So choose wisely. Secondly, Martin pointed out that instead of separate houses, we can sometimes better solve the energy issue with communal systems in a neighborhood. True. That is also what we discussed in one of our earlier presentations. Finally, we are heading for Newcastle in the United Kingdom and meet Mal Well. I don't know if this is an abbreviated name or if Mal is the real first name, but I will use that name regardless. Mal has a detached bungalow as a test case. The house uses 1100 cubic meters of gas and close to 6000 kilowatt hours of electricity. In total, that makes 16,000 kilowatt hours or 23,000 in primary energy. This again seems a moderate use of energy for a house. Not good enough for the future, but average for northwestern Europe. Interestingly, Mel chose a slightly different order of steps, and that's perfectly fine. Sometimes that's the way to reduce the energy bill soonest so that investments in follow up measures are easier. Mel starts with generating renewable energy before saving the demand by laying out a grid of pipes in the ground to produce heat or cold from the soil by means of a heat pump system. If you have this size of a plot, I would do that too. Mel's re reduced step is then quite severe, proposing a big new insulating facade that also lifts the roof to the higher apex. A nice daring solution we will understand better later. Next, Mel proposes several heat efficiency measures, heat recovery, placing fridges in better places, drawing in air from the soil, as well as rainwater collection and usage. Of course, there are PV panels as well for the electricity production, but Mel does something else as well. She puts a glass cover over them and thus creates a solar chimney from which she can extract heat at the top. A very nice and potentially effective solution, as we have seen with the pret loger house. So here you see the difference with what was the situation with the bungalow first and what it looks like after the interventions by Mel. I quite like it. This brings me to the end of this final lecture. A few lessons. You will have noticed that every climate can use the same approach to zero energy buildings, but that the solutions are often different. Passive measures fitting the climate are always suited, but reuse measures are more fitting climates with temper temperature differences. Also, PV can be used everywhere, but the orientation, angle and output is different. Don't use the same figures everywhere. Stay sharp in your calculations when using data and conversions. We also saw that you understand that the primary energy demand of the building is higher than its end use, but it does not mean that you have to solve the entire quantity of energy yourself. Well, that's it. If you want to continue with our more professional Provet online course, please keep an eye on that one, which will probably start in spring 2020. Thank you for joining this course. I hope it has helped you to design and redesign buildings to energy neutral, sustainable ones, which contributes to making the world a better place. Also on behalf of Eric and Tess, I wish you all the luck in the rest of your career and hope to meet you in the near future. Bye.